I'm excited to turn the program over to my friend, Sean Dry Gwen, um, who is the director of the Mary Lou Williams Center. And she is a force, an awesome force. And you, there's nothing better than seeing students connecting with her because it is just a beautiful thing. So Chandra, take it away. Thank you so much, Sterling. Um, as we look toward Duke's second century, it is important to reflect on the century since its inception. Um, and the message that I want um, to leave with you or to share with you today um, is that Black hands have always been at work at Duke, even before Duke was Duke. So, there we go. Uh, initially founded, of course, as Brown Schoolhouse in 1838 in Randolph County, North Carolina, the institution has had seven name changes and educational statuses. Normal College was the immediate precursor to what was to become Trinity College, which moved to Durham in 1892. After contributions from James B. Duke, uh, Duke University was established in 1924 as a memorial to his father and his family. Besides Washington Duke and the infamous Julian S. Carr, who gave the land on which the buildings of East Campus stand, another especially significant personality during this initial period was Braxton Craven, who arrived in 1842 to Union Institute Academy as teacher and then principal. On the 27th day of September, 1857, records indicate Braxton Craven purchased a Negro girl by the name of Melinda for $650. We know a little more of Melinda's story. Sometimes later, he hired what was presumably Duke's first black paid staff, George W. Wall, whose exact date of birth is not known, but who seems to have been born into slavery around 1854 in Randolph County. Apparently, Mr. Wall had become an emancipated teenager when he was hired as a servant by educator and Methodist minister Craven. He soon began working for the college as a janitor and appears to have been the sole employee, apart from faculty members, to follow Trinity College to Durham in 1892. In addition to his slaveholding tendency, Braxton Craven has the distinction of being the longest tenured leader of what was to become Duke University. He died in 1882, before the move to Durham, but presumably not before imprinting his values, since at some point, he taught nearly every class offered and served as president. After 50 years of continuous service to Trinity and Duke, Wall died in the winter of 1930. But as is the experience of many Duke staff, he was, his son followed him into laboring while black at Duke. George Frank Wall was himself an employee of Duke for nearly 60 years. Frank, as he was called by faculty and students, bequeathed $100 to Duke for the purpose of improving relations between Blacks and whites at Duke University. As Duke planted its roots in Durham, new buildings were needed. On the Trinity College campus was built Baldwin Auditorium, which first opened in 1927. And among the buildings of West Campus, Duke University Chapel was the first to be planned and the last of the initial buildings to be built. The chief designer of both buildings was Julian Abel, a prominent African-American architect in the firm of Horace Trombauer, Horace Trombauer, based in Philadelphia. Along with the many other buildings that made up the expanded West Campus, Duke's iconic West Union building was constructed beginning in 1928, and as might be expected, it included plans for segregated facilities as shown on its blueprint. While Abel's race was largely unknown at the time, records indicate there were many black stonemasons and construction workers, though for the most part, their names are also lost to history. As the buildings were erected, black staff were employed at Duke during this early part of the 20th century, primarily in positions in dining halls, custodial staff, and maid service. During the period of 1924 to 1961, in the absence of black students and faculty, we, what we know is there continued to be significant laboring while black. When Duke's Board of Trustees finally made the decision to desegregate the institution in 1961, it began with the graduate and professional schools. Duke's modern era is notable for the opening up of opportunities to learn, teach, and lead while black. Speaks, Johnson, and Robinson were the first three black professional students followed in 1962 by Ida Stevens Owens and Odell Richardson Rubin, the first black students to enroll in the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Of course, 
In September 1963, the fabulous five as we like to think of them, Wilhelmina Rubin Cook, Mary Mitchell Harris, Jean Kendall, Cassandra Smith Rush, and Nathaniel White Jr. formed the first class of Black undergraduates. By November 13, 1967, the first noted instance of Black student activism in the form of the Allen Building study in occurs. Learning while Black also meant leading while Black for most generations of Black students at Duke. There have been notable demonstrations in every decade since. Most who are familiar with Duke are familiar with the Allen Building takeover. It occurred February 13, 1969. Three days later, the university established a Black Studies program and thereafter, the Office of Black Affairs was instituted and has evolved into the Center for Multicultural Affairs. Malcolm X Liberation University was founded in Durham later that year by Howard Fuller and Duke students, and it remained open until 1973. The 2000s opened with Duke students participating in a speak out to question and discuss racism seen around campus. In 2006, Black students responded to the Duke lacrosse incident with another set of demands under the hashtag, what we need from Duke. The Black Student Alliance created a list of essential action items for administrative consideration. In the spring of 2015, and the fall of that same year, a group of Black unaffiliated students issued another set of demands using the hashtag do better. In addition to students learning while Black at Duke, Black faculty have been instrumental in facilitating that learning and have been contributing to the university since the first two faculty joined the institution. The first to join in 1966 was political scientist Dr. Samuel Du Bois Cook, followed by an unknown individual to most, Dr. Jacqueline Jackson, in July of 1968. Over the years, faculty numbers have continued to grow, albeit sometimes slower than some desire. As the first Black faculty initiative expired in 1993, Duke tried again to expand the faculty through the Black Faculty Strategic Initiative and continues in this effort, ably assisted by the first Black Dean of one of Duke's 10 schools, political scientist Paula McLean, who was named Dean of the Graduate School in 2012, following her tenure as the first Black Chair of the Academic Council in 2007. She was followed soon thereafter in 2015 by chemist Valerie Ashby, who was named Dean of Trinity College. Further, as we prepare for Duke's second century, it is exciting to note that the current chair of the Academic Council is also a Black man and a political scientist, Professor Kerry Haney. And at the helm of the Duke Chapel is none other than the Reverend Dr. Luke Powery, the first Black person to hold that position. And as if that was not enough, just this summer, Duke elevated two other long-serving members of the community to senior leadership roles in the persons of Dr. John Blackshear, the new Dean of Students, and Professor John Brown, the new vice provost for the arts. In 1982, there was a critical mass of black alumni, which led to the creation of the, black, of the Duke University Black Alumni Connection, now Duke Black Alumni, DBA. And as alumni numbers have continued to grow and their community has developed under the watchful eye of those black alumni who've cared deeply for this place, enough to criticize it while working to make it better, they have served across the Duke Alumni Association, which saw the ascension of its first Black president, Wilt Austin, in 2002. To be sure, it has been Black people joined by allies who have worked to acknowledge and honor the work of Black people at Duke in the form of the creation of the Julian Abel Outstanding Achievement Award, established in 1989, and the Samuel Du Bois Cook Society in 1997. In 2006, African and African American Studies was elevated to departmental status. And this year marks the inaugural one for Duke's newest living and learning community, the Mitchell White House, named for two of Duke's most illustrious alumni, Mary Mitchell Harris and Nathaniel White, both Durham natives. Continuing the alumni salute, in 2009, Duke Law School alumnus Dan Blue Jr. was elected as chair of the Board of Trustees. Currently, there are six Black members of the board. Suffice it to say, Duke has begun to acknowledge some of those who have labored while Black 
beginning with changing the name of the West Quad to the Abel Quad in honor of architect Julian Abel in 2016. One hopes that this recognition continues to, in earnest moving forward, especially including the recognition of staff. Through it all, staff have been a consistent presence in and impact on the Duke University community. Given the national attention that has resulted from the global pandemic, I thought it most important to use a little time to acknowledge some of the individuals who have been essential to Duke's growth and development. Individuals whose lives are essential, whose work is valued, and who most often are rendered invisible. Of course, there are far too many to name, but I dare speak some of their names so that indeed they will know that they are seen. Some past, some present, all essential. Like stonemason Lucius Jeter, auxiliary services staff like Albert Starr, a Duke barber for more than 50 years, or Willie Williams, assistant general manager at the Duke bookstore. John Love, who for more than 44 years was in charge of Duke's multi-graph department, and Roland Falana, current general manager, office products and services. Dining services staff, William Big Bill Jones, to alumna Barbara Stokes, current director of residential dining and members of her team, Julia Anderson, Sandra Norwood, and Georgia Terrell, each of whom have worked at Duke for more than 30 years. Duke transportation staff, like Georgia's husband, Ronald Terrell, who has worked for Duke for more than 40 years, and Michael Big Mike Eubanks. I want to recognize Duke housekeeping staff. Who, started, who really started it all and number nearly 1,000 and cover over 5 million square feet. Individuals like Vanessa Bass, Bernard Smith, and Oscar Dantzler. Duke athletic staff members like Stan Wilcock, Sheila Allen, and Felicia Tittle. Student affairs staff like Harold Wallace, the first black student advisor and assistant to the Dean of Undergraduate Education in 1969. Or Ed Hill, former director of the Mary Lou Williams Center for Black Culture, who worked at Duke until his passing in 1995. Alumna Linda Capers, director of the Center for Multicultural Affairs, and Jordan Hale, director of new student programs. Or admissions staff, like retired associate director Nancy Austin and current senior assistant director Chris Briggs. The list includes individuals like recently retired after 42 years, Cecilia Goldman, former and first vice president of institutional equity, Myrna Adams, academic affairs staff like retirees alumna, Dr. Caroline Lattimore, who served for over 35 years as an academic dean in Trinity College alongside Dr. Martina Bryant, the first black female dean in Trinity College appointed in 1977. And Connie Simmons, who, who worked at Duke 37 years, beginning as a secretary and retiring as associate dean of the Pratt School of Engineering. And current staff member, alumna Maureen Cullens, director of the Multicultural Resource Center in the School of Medicine. And lastly, Duke parents, Rose, Rosalind and Jose Mickens, who spent 11 and 44 years respectively laboring while Black at Duke. You could not find two individuals who more so tried in their daily personal interactions to live out the legacy of George Wall by working to improve relations between blacks and whites at this institution. Today, I acknowledge all who labor and are heavy laden, living while black at Duke, laboring while black, learning while black, leading while black. Information for today's presentation is drawn from the resources of the Duke University archives as a part, a part of the Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library. Please contact them if you have something you think belongs in the archive and let them be the judge. Valerie and Amy are awesome to work with. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share a brief overview of Duke's Black history. I welcome any questions that you all have now or later. And I didn't do a slide with my contact, but Claribel knows how to reach me. But Mary Lou at duke.edu is also a straight and easy way to be in touch.